Hi, everyone, and welcome to Make It Big 2022. I'm Veronica Cervantes, SVP of Marketing at Big Commerce, and I'll be your host today. We're excited to have uh, great ladies with us today, uh, Tara Syed, Savetri Wilson, and Nicole Cowell will be joining us. These are all incredible leaders in their respective fields. So for starters, I wanna say that we're gonna to try to make this not your typical or norm women in tech panel. Our goal today is really to have an open conversation um, to provide some takeaways and learnings um, that you can take with you, uh, whether you're a woman or not. Uh, we wanna get, get these learnings from leaders in industry that just happen to be women. So we'd love for this session to be interactive. Please, please share your thoughts uh, in the live chat. So with that, I want to go ahead and get started. Um, I think we should maybe get started with a quick round of introductions. Ladies, if you could please just tell us a little bit about your background and what you do. And Tara, we'll start with you. Sure. Thanks, Veronica. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Tara Syed. I'm thrilled to be here uh, among such an esteemed panel. Uh, so thank you for, for inviting me. A uh, little about me. I've spent almost my entire career in tech. Uh, with a focus on building new ways to help people discover and buy or do the things they love, uh, all from the computer we now all carry in our pocket. Um, my role in particular has shifted um, across the years from being deep in data science and analytics um, to more of a GM operator capacity, um, overseeing different facets of businesses depending on the size and stage of the company. Um, I was early days at companies such as One Kings Lane, Pinterest, uh, and Alum. And it's been a great experience uh, seeing seed stage all the way through massive scale. Uh, so today I'm at the world's largest startup, Meta, uh, where I support all of our commerce partnerships work. Um, I also personally invest in and advise several early stage companies with a broad range of focus. Yes, consumer, uh, but also B2B, SaaS and, uh, and services. Great, Tara, thank you so much. Savitra, why don't you go next? Hi everyone, my name is Savitra Wilson. I'm the founder and CEO of Resilia and we are a technology startup that essentially focuses on organizations helping bring the capacity their day to day. And then also large enterprise customers. So think everyone from Goldman Sachs to small uh, vendors and organizations. And we essentially help them scale their impact um, by helping them provide technical assistance and grantee support to their projects and programs. I consider myself a serial entrepreneur. I bootstrapped my first company uh, to seven figures and now have raised uh, close to $50 million for my sec second company, uh, Resilia. So a lot of uh, knowledge around building and launching uh, startups and something that I additionally have uh, experience in helping other startups and angel investing as well. Great, Savitra, thank you so much. Nicole, could you please introduce yourself? Hi everyone, I'm Nicole Caldwell. Thank you so much for being here today and excited to be with this amazing group of women. I am Executive Vice President and Chief Alliance Officer at Prasaga. We are a foundation um, launching the next evolution of blockchain. We're a layer one blockchain. It's really exciting to be in this new Web3 space. I have about 25 years experience, primarily in the IT industry as well. And I also um, advise startups, just like the other ladies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. Well, great. Thanks, everyone. Um, I think next, I'd like to move on to some questions uh, for each of you that are related a bit more to your, you know, unique experiences and background. So, Tara, if we want to start with you, um, you have a pretty impressive resume. You walked us through your background. You've been in tech for over 15 years. As you mentioned, you're currently a director at Meta. Um, also have experience, you know, founding uh, tech startup Alum. You mentioned uh, some other uh, online companies as well. You also mentioned that you're an angel investor and mentor uh, other startups. So I would love to know, you know, from an investor's perspective, what do you look for when deciding whether or not to invest in a company? Sure. Uh, thanks so much, Veronica. And I believe you actually were a, uh, a customer of Alum, uh, if, I I, if my memory was. serves me correctly. Uh, uh, I think I was a customer amazing. and a promoter. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Always great to, to, to hear from, from uh, former customers of something you built with so much love. Um, but with regards to your specific question, um, I actually use the same framework for evaluating investments as I do uh, evaluating companies and teams. I'm, I'm thinking about joining full time or advising. Um, and it's pretty simple. 
I looked at the problem, the solution, and the people. Um, so start with the problem always. First and foremost, uh, the problem has to exist. And uh, you have to know what are people or businesses blocked from doing or inefficiently doing today. Um, and the more specific you can get here, the better. Because yes, climate change is a problem. Streamlining business integrations is a problem. In the case of Alum, uh, helping translate size and fit uh, to every personal, uh, personal customer is a problem. Um, but there are a lot of companies tackling different facets of this. Um, so the more specific you can get about the problem, the better. Um, but on the flip side, there also has to be enough of a problem, it has to be a big enough problem that there's a business opportunity to be had if, if one solves it. Um, roundabout way of essentially the you know, total addressable market. But really, a problem exists and it's a big enough problem uh, that people or businesses are willing to pay for. Um, next, you go to the solution. Um, you know, what is the product or the answer that this particular company has to that problem? And do people love it? Or is there a strong belief um, that they will? It's completely okay if the solution is a totally net new way of doing things. In fact, I love encountering those cars that teams are trying to sell versus faster horses. Um, but so often uh, you see solutions in search of a problem out there. So, so once you think about it, problem first uh, becomes really eye-opening. And finally, arguably the most important part of the picture is the people. Building a business is really hard, as I'm sure most of you know out there who are watching. Um, there will always be challenges. I look at the founders and, and the teams and see what they've endured this far, how it's been. Are they committed? Is there vision? Is there grit? Um, and having been there before, I know that a team walking into something, knowing that there are going to be problems, but approaching that with optimism is essential. Uh, so overall, Things have to fire across the board for me. It has to be an elegant solution to an everyday problem with passionate and perseverant people dedicated to it. Once you look at the world that way, uh, evaluating pitch decks becomes a little bit clearer. There you go. Um, thank you so much, Tara. So I want to pivot to Savetra. Um, you're a tech founder. You're a serial entrepreneur, as you mentioned, and you're one of only five Black women in the U.S. to have raised $50 million in funding for an enterprise software company. Congratulations, by the way, that's yeah. a huge accomplishment. You're also a published author, I will say, check her stuff out. Um, what advice do you have for entrepreneurs, women or otherwise, as they're looking to raise VC funding and what should they look out for at each stage of funding? Yes, absolutely. So right now we're such in a unpredictable uh, market, right? So we're seeing a lot of fluctuations um, and VC investment generally, I would say over the past several months pulled back, right? So we saw a lot of our investors who pause, but I do see a lot of this opening up um, as we kind of go into the last quarter of the year. Um, but I will say that it's never been a better time for uh, startups to have to put their best foot forward. Now for women, we always have to do this to raise capital. So it's not that uh, off brand for us always having to exceed expectations in order to uh, actually get the funding that we need. Uh, but we've raised every from pre-seed to now series B, um, I'm going to just kind of start with the idea of, say, you're raising your first round of capital. Uh, for sure, you have to ensure that you know the investors who are investing in your specific sector. Um, so oftentimes when we go out to raise capital to begin with, uh, there's a disconnect, right? Oftentimes when we haven't done it before of who actually is investing checks in our types of companies, um, building relationships. And when I first started out raising capital, I based in you know New Orleans, Louisiana, I wasn't in the uh, the mecca of tech, and so I would have to fly out um, to the Bay Area, I had to fly out to New York, and I had to meet investors, and I began building relationships. And so, although my pre-seed round came from angels and those who believed in me, later on, those relationships that I had built over time allowed me to get calls scheduled faster, allowed for me to have a inroads into what investors were thinking and what they were looking for down the road. But early on, you really have to just focus on your narrative and your pitch as a founder and being able to communicate why you are the individual or your team are the individuals to really scale and launch this product and how you can do that with the investment that you're seeking. And so really narrow and focus in 
on being able to communicate that very clearly and in a very succinct way. And as Atara said, being able to also communicate that plan and that your market is large enough to sell in. Um, I think that this is something that um, founders kind of underestimate, right? And they're, they get caught up in like metrics. Early on, it's truly about you. So make sure that you're focused on that. Um, as you go into other rounds, series A and series B, it definitely becomes more metrics and traction focus. And so ensuring that your finances are squared up, ensuring that you can actually show how your product uh, has grown over time is gonna be the focus of those later rounds. Um, but first and foremost, ensuring that you have um, the right individuals in place and that you are the founder um, that's going to build this amazing company and grow it to scale should be your focus in getting a very tight pitch deck that communicates that in your market. Um, and so those are just some tidbits around um, early stage pitching, honing in on your narrative, and then later stage uh, focusing on that traction and uh, what got you there and the team that's going to get you to the next level. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's really interesting to hear that it's not, it's, you know, it, it really defers as the business matures. And then going back to what Tara said, um, having that, that story, right. The, you know, whether it's the, the kind of that, that one, two, three, that Tara was talking about, or, you know, in your, what you just shared with us, building relationships and getting that narrative, right. Um, that's, it's, it's super valuable to hear that that story is, is really important, especially for early stage. Um, thank you for that. So I want to go ahead and pivot to Nicole, um, who's, you know, a startup advisor. She mentioned earlier, she's with Prasaga as the chief alliance officer, um, also at Prasaga working to empower women in the Web3 space via the WeSaga program. Um, Nicole, I'd really love to hear what advice you can give women or, you know, any entrepreneur really, um, who is looking to explore this new space, whether that's, you know, crypto or NFTs, uh, how can they get started? Oh, that's such a good question. I actually had somebody ask me the other day on an AMA and ask me anything. How did you get started in this space? And I said, well, yeah, I've been in technology for a long time, but the Web3 space is new for me. And Web1 was all about internet, right? We're getting on the internet. Web2, we're on the internet and we're reading but we're also writing, we're contributing to the internet. Think social media, putting your pictures up there, um, contributing in different ways. Well, Web3 is that next evolution of the internet basically. And it's um, reading, you're going and finding information, you're writing, you're contributing, but now you're taking ownership. So it's a little different, it's that next evolution. And I think it's scary and intimidating for a lot of people. I mean, many people have embraced it, but change is always a little bit tricky, right? And so for me, whenever they ask me that question, yes, I have an IT background. I'm not a technologist, but I've been in the industry a long time. I was a little bit resistant. I have to admit, I was a little judgmental of it and said, oh, I don't know if I want to get involved in that. And I thought it was only about crypto, right? And that just wasn't appealing to me. And I went back to Walt Whitman's quote, be curious, not judgmental. And I, I took a deep breath and I said, okay, I'm going to pull the judgment back and I'm going to get curious about this. And when I did, it opened a whole new world for me. I wouldn't be here today, honestly, if I hadn't seen that Ted Lasso um, episode where he talked about be curious, not judgmental. It really resonated. And I think that's my advice for people who are you know, thinking about web three, or they've heard about it. I'm sure there's, you know, we all have our judgments, but just stop for a moment and get curious about it and ask questions. One of the best things you can do is just start to educate yourself, go on YouTube. It's the search engine, right? You can find so much information out there. And, you know, it's interesting to me too, because I've met so many people who are not technologists who are in this new web three world. A lot of artists. I met an amazing woman who started a yoga DAO and she wanted to create this whole metaverse with yoga. And it was really interesting, um, the whole concept. But I think you don't have to be in technology to be part of Web3. We're all going to be using Web3 at some point in time very soon. And I think the biggest thing is just ask questions, stay open minded. And then also, if you're not in technology, but you have some new ideas and you think, oh, we could do something online about this, 
then partner. I mean, I'm in alliances and partnerships. This is what I do. I love it because you can, if you have this great idea, you want to do something, go find a developer. They're out there. They want to work with you. I've put teams together um, from people who are in college who are just getting started and have a cool idea in a hackathon or an idea-a-thon. And then they meet these developers and all of a sudden they're coming up with this new solution. So that's something you can do. And you can also, you know, if you want to get started yourself after the Make It Big conference, um, go search for a crypto digital wallet. Easiest way to get into crypto. And just know that Web3 is crypto, it is blockchain, it is metaverse, it is NFTs. You can do a search, find all the information, but go start a wallet. And usually they have ways in their little education sessions that you can take, that you can earn some digital currency. So it's a great way to get started and easy. Thanks for that, Nicole. And I love any Ted Lasso quote. It's always a good thing. Um, and I, you know, I love that, uh, be curious, not judgmental because it is moving rapidly, but still kind of esoteric. And I know a lot of folks, even in tech are a little bit scared. Yeah. So, um, I think that's great advice. Thanks for that. Um, so now I'd like to, to throw a f- just a couple of general questions out. Um, you know, each of you ladies has had some amazing accomplishments, which we talked about a little bit. Um, I'd like to know what advice have you maybe received in your career that has helped you? And then on the flip side, was there ever a piece of advice that you didn't take that you are really glad you didn't take? Um, so Tara, um, why don't you get us started? Sure. Uh, my my good piece of advice actually parlays off of what Nicole described pretty pretty well. So my dad actually, who was an immigrant and entrepreneur, uh, told me once, "Don't pre-negotiate yourself out of opportunities." So whether it's a a big strategy shift, a new job opportunity, or a new investment opportunity, it can't hurt to to swiftly but very quickly get more data until you actually have a real decision to make. Um, So often I see people, uh, oftentimes earlier in their careers, especially uh, oftentimes women, who find a reason to not have that initial step forward, that initial conversation. Oh, I'm not sure I'm ready to make a move right now. Or, oh, I don't understand crypto, and so not ready to to take investment meetings for for crypto companies. Um, Honestly, at the early junctures of these things, no one's asking you to yet. So, So give yourself as many chances as you can to, to have, actually have that informed choice. Um, it's definitely helped me and um, in the spirit of being curious, like learn and, and actually end up in, in roles or, or writing checks where I never thought I would and very happy that I did. Um, on the flip side, I guess I'll, I'll tailor your question a little bit. So less about bad advice I didn't take, but bad advice I did take, um, which still proved to be a, a good lesson. So, so I got advice from an from a old manager of mine to downplay my passion for a particular recommendation I was very excited about um, because uh, I didn't want to come off as scary. Uh, I I followed that advice uh, and was so angry when the recommendation didn't get adopted anyway. Um, It it was then that I vowed that there are definitely ways to tailor how you show up, um, but it should always be you showing up, right? Like be your authentic self and, uh, and, and read the situation, but don't don't change, I guess, who you are, uh, because you think that will uh, that will be the short term outcome that you want. Does that make sense? It does. Savitra, anything you want to add? Yes. So I would say great advice is putting the right and uh, right people around you, right. And so when I think about um, founders, ensuring that you have a peer group of others who are also experiencing some of the same pains and wins and fails and successes that you are, and so that you know that you're not going through it along, and so that you have someone to talk through it. Also having um, individuals around you who have maybe done what you're trying to do at scale, whether that's exiting a company or going um, public. Uh, I just recently, a few months ago, brought on executive coach, and I was so hesitant for so long in doing this just because I felt, wow, these guys are really expensive. Like, do I want to put this type of investment in this executive coach? Will I really uh, get the rewards from it? And once I did, 
I knew it was the right decision. Like immediately the value that I was able to um, take and continuously um, pull for my executive coach. Um, and then I also, those who are coming up that may be one stage behind me as far as in their company, they also are able to teach me things. And I feel that I'm not so siloed in my own bubble of founders who raise capital. And I'm also able to um, help them in ways. And so definitely putting the right people around you with some great advice um, that I receive at various levels, right? As you grow your business. Um, the On the flip side, you know, bad advice that I receive and maybe not bad advice because for some founders, it could have been the right advice, uh, but I applied for a, uh, you know, top two accelerator, right, in the US. And um, I reached out for just feedback and the CEO of that accelerator said, you know, don't worry about applying. You need to focus on finding uh, a technical co-founder because I'm a non-technical founder. Um, well, fast forward to today, right? The history has kind of definitely been made in many different ways and we continue to grow and scale the company. I have an amazing CTO, but I actually didn't take uh, that advice. And I think had I um, paused everything around me, right, um, to try to force this uh, relationship with a co-founder that was technical um, and really believe that I couldn't build a company because I was a non-technical founder. I think it would have stifled if not killed the company um, had I taken that advice. And so although that may have been the right advice for another founder, it wasn't the right advice for me at that time. Yeah, that's such a good point. Uh, what's good for one person is not necessarily relevant or good for the other. And I love what you said about surrounding yourself uh, with the right people you know, if that's a person that's done it before you, I think a sign of a good leader is someone who's not threatened or afraid of that, right? Um, so I'd like to, to move on to another question. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about allyship in the workplace, um, specifically, you know, encouraging male colleagues or peers to not only be allies, but to be advocates for women leaders. Um, Sabetri, do you want to chime in on that? Yeah, I'll kind of just um, frame uh, the idea of allies and advocates in itself. And I'm pulling this from a page of my dear friend, Amber Cabral's um, book. And she often talks about allies and advocates in the sense of DEI um, and knowing the difference and truly knowing that an ally is someone that you know who supports you and they um, cheer for you, right? On the sidelines when you're running that race. But an advocate also being someone that's in that boardroom or in that meeting or in that investment community, and that's your champion, and they speak up for you on your behalf. And in doing so, they advance you in some form or fashion, right? And so I think it's important that we also know like the difference between someone who's an ally, who you know isn't going to try uh, to bring harm, you know, for you, but also someone who is an advocate who goes the extra mile to ensure that your presence is felt and that um, their uh, championing of you actually advances you in the workplace or uh, otherwise. And so I'll just kind of add that. And if anyone else has some specific um, stories or, or ways that men or anyone really can be allies and advocates, we pass it on. Thanks, Savitra. Any anything anyone? has to add to that. If not, we'll move on to another one. I think just even, even using the word advocacy instead of ally is something that we huh. could all, you know, start doing. I guess that's what I'll challenge us all is we've made the leap to like allies generally understood term. Let's, let's yeah. advance to advocacy. Let's do it. Yeah. I like it. It feels more active, you know? Um, so I think it's fair to say we're all, everyone on this call is, is a believer in empowering others, uh, you know, at whatever stage of their career. Um, you know, I'd like to know, maybe we start with Nicole, do you have any advice for the next generation of leaders? I go back to that quote. It just works so well. Be curious, not judgmental. I think, um, allowing yourself to be curious is going to help you so much in your career, um, help you engage with others too, because you can use it with others, you can use it with yourself. And I think too, that remembering that mindset matters first and foremost. I mean, it's, it's so important to have that open mindset to allow yourself to grow. And there's a book that I wanted to recommend, um, and it just kind of works well with this make it big theme, right? Is Go Big Now from Julia Pimsler. It's all about mindset. I think that's a good one to start with. Um, have fun along the way and allow yourself to just try. 
those would be my, my uh, biggest tips for anyone uh, for that next generation of leaders. Thanks, Nicole. Tara or Savitra, any, any thoughts? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in here. I, I guess, you know, probably something folks haven't heard before, but can't emphasize enough. Uh, life's not a straight line. Your career is not a straight line. Building your company is not a straight line. And so recognizing that there's still uh, kind of a North Star out there and, and uh, you're going to weave, bob and weave along the way is, is so important and, and to take it in stride. Um, you'll look back and, and miss the times that you thought were the most challenging uh, and, uh, and, and uh, just relish it. I agree with Nicole and enjoy living uh, in, that, in that journey. Um, and I'll just add, uh, be mindful of how you deal with disappointment. Because uh, I think that the way you deal with disappointment will essentially and can like alter your entire trajectory, right? Um, oftentimes, you may not get the thing that you thought you were going to um, get or that investor who you felt was going to invest didn't invest. Um, you can't allow that to deter you from um, continuing uh, to strive for what you ultimately uh, desire. Um, and how you deal with disappointment is going to determine so much of your outcome in life. And so just be mindful of that because oftentimes our feelings can guide us in ways that we might not necessarily be mindful of because of that feeling of disappointment letting us down. And I think that's particularly true for like women um, in many instances. Thanks for that, Savitra. So we have time for one quick question that came in uh, from Jermaine in the live chat. Thank you, Jermaine. Um, were there any obstacles that came as a surprise to you through your journey or an anecdote that has stuck with you? So maybe we start with Nicole. There are always going to be obstacles. That's the thing. And I, but I think that those are the things that, you know, do make you stronger. You learn from them. Um, somebody asked me, you know, I was interviewing one time and they said, what's your favorite thing about winning deals? And I said, well, it's actually, not just the wins, but when we lose, we learn so much from them. So I think um, just realizing those obstacles are going to happen. They're happening for a reason. And if you learn something from them, you're, you're coming out so much stronger and so much better. Thanks, Nicole. Tara, anything to add? Sure. I, I guess, you know, parroting Nicole, obstacles are always going to happen. And I think what stands out to me is, is being, uh, being clear about whether this obstacle is like a moment or a trend, right? The big, most memorable obstacle for me is like when March, 2020, when, when COVID times hit running a consumer marketplace, uh, the world kind of changed, right? Moment. Uh, but in terms of trend, maybe Savitra, you understand, like maybe that, you know, what, what, how things are looking from a fundraising picture, whether you're getting the same feedback over and over again, right? back to the data and pattern matching. So I guess just no obstacles are there, but if you discern moment versus trend and, and go from there, I, I'd say that's that's served me and, and helped me uh, kind of overcome. Yeah, that. I would agree with that. You know, that only, I raised my series A, uh, we closed it in uh, towards the end of March, 2020. So during the pandemic and while everything was closing around us, and then we went out to raise our series B, the market shift on us. I was like, what is, what is the bad luck going on with the time frames in which I'm raising capital? Um, and so even when, as I've like matured and um, gotten more experiences in raising capital, there's always some element of surprise that I'm like, am I still experiencing this? Uh, and so just take it in stride, you know, and um, figure out a way to deal with it and continue to move forward. That's great. So I think we have a little over a minute left. So this might be lightning round, but to wrap up, um, are there any career development resources that you would recommend for our audience? Any specific podcast, books, courses? I'm going to shout out Savitra again, published author, but um, maybe we start with, uh, with Tara. Any, anything that you'd quickly like to share in terms of a resource? Sure. In general, I think other people's stories are my favorite resource and, and story time. So, so ask for stories from people you admire. Um, podcast like how I built this just generally absorbing real real life instead of the theory uh, for me has worked the best great Nicole I love that Tara and um, self-plug here my podcast the corporate expat experience and it's about stories of people who left the corporate world and became entrepreneurs and how they did it so just like you stories 
Thanks, Nicole. Savitra, you want to close this out? Yeah. So as a founder, you're looking to raise capital. There's so many uh, spaces that you can go from Crunchbase to find investors to a uh, Y Combinator, firstround.com, all these spaces that are publishing um, not only stories and uh, documents and other various resources for you. Uh, similarly, I have uh, a website, just my first and last name.com. And I have uh, a rate card, right? Where uh, you can download for free. I have my first pitch deck that you can download for free, just there and available founders. And I get so many emails and DMs from um, entrepreneurs who said that they ended up getting two to three times uh, contract value because they use my rate car. And so some things like that are just um, really encouraging and even more motivation for other uh, entrepreneurs and founders to share resources and um, just lessons right along the way to help uh, the future um, entrepreneurs and founders be great. So that's what I'll leave with. Veronica, Thank sounds you. like you and I need to start a podcast or something. I mean, maybe we're, we're, I think we got to be. I think we got to do, do. We have to okay. have some side side things. Gotta so do thank it. you, yep. ladies. Thanks to all of our panelists. I hope everyone feels inspired by today's conversation. Please tune into the rest of Make It Big, um, and shout us out on social media at Big Commerce. Thanks so much, everyone, for joining, and have a great day.